and uh, we're left to do uh, our sessions online and on Zoom, whatever Zoom means. But I just want to thank, I want to start off by thanking uh, the Poolsville seniors, uh, Maria, President Maria Branscombe, and of course, Melissa, and Denise Jackson, uh, Jacqueline, who just, you know, she called me several times, and I was really, really honored that they had me to come on and speak about something that I'm very, very passionate about. And that's the African-American communities. Uh, go ahead, Zach, you can put the first frame up. Uh, before, before you do that, I just wanna, I wanna give you a, a little warning, okay? Those people out there who are concerned about being politically correct, I wanna let you know that uh, during this presentation, I'm gonna make reference to African-Americans as black people, Negroes, and colored people. So all three or all four, I answer to or have answered to at some point in time. Okay, Zach. Okay, but first I wanna do, first thing I wanna do is uh, the, the first slide is uh, the African-American communities. I wanna talk about them and how the African-American communities surrounding Poolsville have impacted our town and our nation. I even went so far as to put nation in there. You're gonna find out all about that pretty soon. And it's so interesting to me that we're so clo uh, close proximity to these communities. And for some reason or another, uh, a lot of people are unaware. And I'll go ahead and you hit the next slide for me, please. Okay. Okay. So to folks out there, some people, this is a surprise. Martinsburg, where is that? Jerusalem, where is that? But I'm sure you know about Jerusalem because a lot of people use that road. Mount Ephraim, Big Woods, Jonesville, and of course, Sugar Land. A lot of people, most of the people, I won't say all of the people, but a lot of the people who make Poolsville their home have no clue and have never heard of, uh, of these uh, communities. Uh, these communities were made up of free slaves. Uh, they were carpenters, uh, farmers, craftsmen, men and women who built their own homes, schools, stores, and of course churches. And I say of course churches is because that's the only structure that slaves could even think about building during that time is a, is a church, a place of worship. So, and in my mind, this is in my mind, of course, uh, I believe that these communities, because I have a, pers a personal knowledge about them, uh, arguably, uh, they contributed to the commerce and economic stability of this town. Uh, otherwise, I'd say they would be just another zip code. And you know about the zip codes around Poolsville, Barnesville, and that's uh, Bellsville, Dawsonville, Dickerson, they're not the thriving economic community that Poolsville is, and we're right in line with those. So I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes. You don't have to, but close your eyes and, and think back. Think about the slave migration north and the Underground Railroad and Poolsville's proximity to the Potomac River, which is something that you, know, you don't think about a lot, but we're close to the river and Sugarland, and I'll talk, talk about Sugarland a little bit more, is also close to the river. So we've had all kinds of tales and stories about caves and things that are, uh, that uh, some of these communities had to, uh, to help the slaves who were coming from the south to the north. Some of them true, some of them fable. But I can tell you firsthand that on the property in Sugarland where I live, that there's a, there's a story behind that one also. Okay, since Martinsburg is first on the list, let me talk about Martinsburg. Where is it? It's off White's Ferry Road. As you're going towards, and everybody knows where the Haunted, Haunted Forest is. Okay, that community existed prior to the Civil War, before the Civil War. Uh, it uh, existed as a, a biracial community. So, you know, so white and blacks were living there. They were joined uh, by ex-slaves after the Civil War and soon became a thriving community. That's up in Martinsburg. There is a little, there's little evidence of a community now, 
all, the only thing that's left is a school or I guess remnants of a school and a church building. Chuck Copeland, uh, or Pastor Chuck, as a lot of you know from Hosanna Worship, is a direct descendant of the families from Martinsburg and is a current member of, uh, uh, of the, uh, he is the current pastor of the uh, Hosanna Worship Church and that's moved into the building across from the high school, the, the uh, Baptist Church, that also houses the uh, Poolsville Senior Center. Jerusalem. Where is the community of Jerusalem? Right off Jerusalem Road. Jerusalem Road was settled by freed slaves who ran away. This is what the, you know, the information that I received from Virginia. A lot of the slaves, runaway slaves from Virginia came and settled in Jerusalem. Many ancestors remain in the Jerusalem community today. Uh, this 150 year old community is located uh, right across from what we know now as Tama 1 or in Tama 2. Uh, the newly constructed church, the church built uh, in the 1950s, stands at the crossroad of Jerusalem Road and Jerusalem Church Road. Okay, Mount Ephraim, where is that? I had a tough time finding that community because it hardly exists. The, the road goes up there. It was the first American, uh, the first American African American landowner, a guy by the name of David Moody. Uh, apparently, he was uh, sold that property as a free man in 1814, several years before this was born. So a lot of this going on and a lot of these things that are happening, you're just I on earth and I uncovered a lot of these things and it was just very shocking to me. Anyway, it gets his name from a storekeeper. The storekeeper had tracts and tracts of land. Uh, he was Ephraim, Ephraim Harris, not Ephraim Zimmerus, but Ephraim Harris. But anyway, he, uh, eventually uh, uh, managed to sell a lot of his, uh, his, his property to uh, the residents of Mount Ephraim, but they up and moved away. And so there's hardly anything left of the African-American community of Mount Ephraim today. Big Woods, a lot of you have heard of Big Woods because a, a lot of residents still sit uh, on Big Woods Road. It's right off 109 as you're going out towards uh, Frederick. It's the oldest community. It's the oldest African-American community. Many of the African-Americans, like I said, still live there today. And one of the founders, uh, a guy by the name of James, I think James Spencer, acquired 50 acres by a white landowner in 18, 1813. So he was, he was way back there also. Okay, move down, let's, let's move down to Jonesville. Okay, keep in mind, Jonesville and and Jerusalem, they almost intersect. And it's right off of Jerusalem Road at Jones Lane. And the first tract of land was purchased by Erasmus Jones, of course, <laughs> around 1866. And by the turn of the century, it was a thriving community. A lot of the homes exist in the, in the, in the community today. You can drive through, some of the homes are, have been built and rebuilt, and it's a very, very striking community right off of uh, Jones Lane. But I'm going to tell you about, okay, Zach, I'm going to tell you about a structure that, uh, uh, that, that was in uh, Jonesville. And that structure, that, that house, that dilapidated house that you see on your screen, uh, I'm going to tell you where it is today. It's called the Jones Hall Sims House, the Jones Hall Sims House. And the character of this house is this. It's two story. It's a two story house. And the slaves or ex slaves did not build two story houses. They had the log cabins and the one story little cottages and things of that nature. But when a slave went up to the second floor, you had a two story, let's move it on up. It was a symbol of freedom. And it was a major difference than the, the one story cabins. And uh, it was a big, big deal. As a matter of fact, it was such a big deal that, go ahead, Zach. They took it apart. <laughs> they took it apart. They took it, they, they, they tore it down, and they reassembled it at the National Museum 
of African American history and culture, which stands on the, the, the mall today. Why did they pick that house? I'm really not sure, but probably some of the, one of the reasons why they picked that house and they were, uh, was because of the fact that uh, it, was two, it was a two-story structure. So they picked it out in Jones, Jones Lane, right a, a stone's throw from the middle of town of Poolsville, and it's now in the National Mall. And uh, I've been there. I've been down to the, uh, the mall and been to the uh, museum with my family, and it is, in one word, awesome. And to my surprise, on the third floor, on the third floor of the museum, there's so much, so much there about Montgomery County and about Poolsville, Sugar Land. Okay, now I, it's, it surprised me, but a lot of things didn't surprise me. Okay, go to the next slide. Okay, there we go. Sweet spot. It looks like the sweet spot. I can do that myself. Okay, <laughs> he, he tells me that I can advance this thing all by myself. <laughs> I don't need him to do it. But at any rate, that, you know, a lot of these things are so exciting to me. Okay, you take a look, that's the sweet spot. That's the, you know, the, the dump that we have in Poolsville. And I love it. You know, I, now they put a whole lot of restrictions. You can't take bullets, you can't take steel, you can't take this, you can't take that. Gets on my nerves now, so I just go ahead and burn my own trash. No, I don't do that. But I'll tell you this, it used to house, it, in, the, in the old days, when it was first built, it was built as the Negro school or the colored school that uh, was uh, paid for by philanthropists, if I can get that word out, Julius Rosenberg. He was uh, the president of uh, Sears and Roebuck. And back at the turn of the century, he thought and he believed that uh, what the uh, colored children needed in the rural South, and we're going to, you know, we're going to include Maryland as a rural South. Uh, what they needed was schools. You know, hello. <laughs> I mean, what they needed was schools. And so he sponsored. He, I said he sponsored, but he oversaw the building of over four thousand five hundred schools in the rural South. Two hundred and seventy of those schools were built in the state of Maryland and 15 were in Montgomery County. And this happens to be one of them, the one that's on the corner of Jerusalem Road and Jones Lane is, uh, was the old colored school. Uh, it only went up to eighth grade. Oh, I'm doing okay. <laughs> uh, it only went up to eighth grade. But it was, it was something. And uh, some of the uh, people who had to go there, there was no floors, there was no heat, but he hit it right on the nail. Education is the key to freedom. He knew it, he, he knew that. Learning to read was one of the things that was deprived from slaves. You know, it was against the law, it was written, it was law. So he decided on his own that this is what he was going to do. For better or for worse, I'm not sure who took advantage of it or how many children took advantage of it. But again, uh, Julius Rosen, Rosenwald, uh, he was, uh, again, from the uh, Sears and Roebuck, the president, and uh, this is what he did. Let me go to the next slide. I did it all by myself. There's Julius right there in the middle. Right in the middle, and uh, he uh, has a little colored children there with his name, their name, his name on their chest, every letter. But anyway, this is in a, uh, uh, a recent news article. Uh, he established 270 schools in the state of Maryland, in the state of Maryland, and again, 15 in Montgomery County. Here's a little book authored by Ray Hohen. And I'm sh they're not in publication anymore, but I have it here because you may be able to get your hands on it. It says Poolsville 250 years, it's, uh, from Indians to the internet. And he has sections, uh, a great uh, uh, amount of information on these six communities. And, and Ray uh, uh, did a great job. So I just put that out there. And if you have it somewhere on your bookshelf, if, you, if you've seen it, if you have a copy, I have a couple of copies, but 
I just wanted to throw that out as a shameless plug to Ray Holy. Okay, there it is. That's the uh, museum. That's the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And it is dynamic. It is three floors or four floors. I'm not sure how many floors it is now, but it was on the third floor is uh, where you can see things that are familiar to you from Montgomery County. And it, uh, it was really striking that uh, some of my own ancestors are on the wall there, but it's right there on the mall. It's free. You have to, uh, uh, get your tickets online. And I don't know what the situation is now with everybody having to wear a mask and, and whatnot. But again, shameless plug. That's a great place to go and spend the day. And you can end up spending the whole day. <laughs> you can spend the whole day and still not see everything. But you will be um, amused by a lot of it. Okay. It, uh, I just I want to tell you that it houses uh, over 3,700 in individual pieces of history. And it uh, chronicles 400 years of African Americans' proudest and most painful moments. And uh, again, yeah, it's it, it, the pain, slavery and uh, uh, Jim Crow and that sort of thing. It's, it's history. And it's not uh, for anyone to stand and get angry about or anyone to feel guilty about. Uh, either side of the coin, it's, it's history. And I don't remember ever getting angry about uh, some of the things in my history book. Okay. okay, where are we? This is also, this is also on the third floor. This is one of the um, uh, exhibits and uh, this was on the wall. And uh, this, as you, can, as you can see, you can read it. I'm not going to read from it, but it uh, makes reference to the Montgomery County. And also this, the Jones Hall Sims House. And that's the one that was torn down and rebuilt uh, and taken to the museum. And that's the plaque. That little thing you see on the picture right there is because of the uh, uh, flash of my camera, apparently did that. So, but at any rate, I uh, hope that if you get down there and when you stop wearing masks and the things like that, you can get to see it. Okay. Sugarland, the last one on the list. Last but not least is uh, where my uh, family is from, the Sugarland community. And Sugarland sits off Hughes Road, not too far from where I live. As a matter of fact, I still consider myself in Sugarland. Uh, it was founded in 1871 uh, after the, pro the property was, uh, was purchased by three former slaves. William Taylor, remember that name, <laughs> Patrick Hebron, and John Diggs. They, were, they purchased the property from a man named George W. Dawson, and he was very generous. They paid the uh, top dollar price of 25 bucks, $25. But the deed specified that the land would be used for a church, a school, and a burial site for people of color. Most of the descendants of Sugar Land had moved out and moved on. Only the tiny St. Paul's Community Church and Cemetery remain. Okay, now this picture was uh, taken by one of our commissioners and it's striking because uh, Martin Radigan is uh, a fantastic photographer, by the way. That's a plug for him. And I hope he's okay with me using his beautiful, beautiful picture over and over again. But uh, Martin Radigan, one of our commissioners, uh, took that picture and, uh, and gave it to me. So uh, like I said, you know, unfortunately, most of the buildings and physical evidence of the communities are gone. Okay, and, and uh, unfortunately, too, is that uh, most of the descendants, not the descendants, most of the folks who were around at that time couldn't write. So there's not a lot of written history. And uh, you got six communities and, and nobody was logging down what, so it, uh, what happened or what occurred. But the best thing they did was they, you know, they, word of mouth. And each church did have a scribe. 
With few photographs and very thick, little written and information word of mouth, it's a really a testament to a handful of the uh, Sugarland descendants. It really is a testament to them that so much information has gotten us, gotten to us, and gotten out. That church houses now houses a museum. And Gwen Reese, Gwen Hebron Reese, and her cousins, Suzanne Johnson and Nettie Johnson, uh, they interviewed the folks. They scrounged through papers and information and documents, folklore. And they established back in 1995, the Sugarland Ethno History Project. I hope that you remember that, the Sugarland Ethno History Project. There's Gwen. She's been written up in, in all sorts of papers. Not only <laughs> Randy Davis's monocle, but the Gazette, the Washington Post have done articles on the work that she has done. These ladies did the best that they could in interviewing people and getting information. And if you can, and you can, it's 10 minutes from Poolsville, go up, I'll get you, I'll get a key, and we can go in and you can see some of the artifacts, the pictures and things that are in the church today. Uh, since 1995, they have worked tirelessly to preserve all of these artifacts. And it's come, it came to fruition. Uh, it's, it's a collection of, of keepsakes that have been donated. Uh, uh, let's go. And she's been rewarded by various places. This is a Whisper Award that she's receiving. That's Gwen Reese. And uh, I think it was last year she was our Grand Marshal. Right. Gwen was the Grand Marshal of the Poolsville Day Parade last year. And a lot of people were wondering, oh, you know, unless they were close enough to get the information, who that lady was, <laughs> you know, and what did she do? Well, now you know. I don't know how, how many people we have out here, but uh, we go through uh, a lot to, to establish who is going to be the Grand Marshal for the year. And she, uh, I think she was a unanimous choice as being uh, the Grand Marshal and the first African American Grand Marshal in the Poolsville Day Parade. So anyway, that's the Poolsville Day Project. I mean, it's <laughs> the Poolsville Day Project. Poolsville <laughs> Ethno History Project. And that's a brochure. That's one of her brochures. Uh, if this was live, I'd be able to hand them out like they were, you know, candy or whatever. I'd be able to hand them to you. you but I don't want to, I wouldn't do that because I've always prided myself in not handing out literature if I was talking because people get engrossed in what they have in their hands and start reading and not paying attention to you. And I want all the attention. So anyway, uh, here's the, uh, the front of the brochure. It says uh, Sugarland Ethno History Project. And I, what I'd like, what I'd really like to see is that the elementary school, 10 minutes away, plan a trip up, up uh, Sugarland Road and walk through and walk through the, 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 the history because there's so much behind it and, uh, and so much uh, that, that they need to see in the middle school and as well as the high school. I was uh, in Sandy Springs at the Slave Museum and they have, they've done a real great job out there uh, in, in getting folks to their museum. Uh, but uh, of course they have uh, a larger, a much larger display than, than we do. Let's see. 1952. That's uh, uh, Children's Day. That's Children's Day. That, that picture came from my own grandmother. And it, the, the, the church looks just about the same as it did in 1952. And again, you go up, you look inside, you see some of the artifacts, you see some of the pictures, and you think to yourself, you think back to yourself. This is, this is the only place that uh, these ex-slaves could congregate. Ah, slave quarters. Uh, Miss LeMasters uh, contributed that, that picture. That's off Sugar Land Road. That's the old slave quarters and hasn't been torn down. And the structure looks a little dilapidated. You can also see that on your trip. 
Did I push the right button? Mm -hmm. Okay. This is uh, an, another award that, that back in 2015 from the uh, Montgomery Preservation, they, they thought that what the, uh, the work that Gwen Reese and her cousins did was also spectacular. And uh, they awarded her that. And in the front of the building, in the, in the brick and casing right here, are members of the St. Paul's Community Church. Though the, the names there are the names of the, the, the folks who are probably, a lot of them are uh, buried at the, in the cemetery, which is adjacent to the church. So that's in front of the church. Okay, here, this is a picture of the Sugarland Seneca Quarry in the late 1800s, okay? Sugarland Seneca Quarry, remember that. I want you to remember that is because that's where the red brick comes from. The red brick that did that. And that's the Smithsonian Castle. And if you go back here, you say, wow, Sugarland, how'd that happen? Well, the Smithsonian Castle is probably the Outside of the Lincoln Memorial and the and the Capitol, the most striking uh, structure on the uh, on the uh, mall today is is that castle. Everybody sees that. Uh, the quarry, which is let's see, the quarry here, it's off. I guess it's to Shelfie Road. It's off a of river road. The quarry is still there. It's in, of course, it's in ruins. Uh, I mean, you can get to it in the fall, but I wouldn't try to go in the summertime. Uh, the Seneca sandstone uh, that uh, you see on the buildings, uh, the redstone was formed in late, uh, what's it, the Triassic age, something like different than Jurassic. And that was between two, uh, 210 and 230. The year 210 and 230 is when they estimate the red brick as forming. Uh, the cutting mill opened in uh, 1868 and it created a lot of jobs, a lot of jobs for the ex-slaves in the, in the Sugar Land community. And uh, the buildings that were uh, constructed with the red sandstone, put on a barge now, put on a barge and everybody knows where the canal is and went all the way downtown, brick by brick. And a lot of the structures went off to Baltimore and Washington and, and uh, uh, the Adams Morgan District, DuPont Circle, uh, a lot of the beautiful structures downtown came right out of uh, the quarry and at the hands of the slaves who probably got, you know, 10 cents a day for labor. <laughs> I'm just guessing. Okay, I zoom past uh, the uh, Smithsonian Castle. That's a lot of brick. That's a lot of towing and that's a lot of a lot of mules down, down the canal. But it's like anything else, it's work. Now this, this structure of red stone that came out of uh, Seneca Quarry is the, the, ch uh, the chimney, the remaining ch uh, structure of my great grandmother's house. It's where my mother spent her summer before the house burned down and the only thing <laughs> that's left, and I took a picture of that myself, is the red brick chimney, the red sandstone. So it's a historic, it's, a, it's like a monument to me. And it's about, oh, maybe two to 300 yards away from where I live now. You have to go down a creek and up a hill. But at any rate, uh, it's symbolic to me. It's symbolic of my past and, and my present. And, Another shameless plug, that's me, standing near the chimney uh, that my wife Faith took of me uh, maybe a couple of falls ago. I don't go into those woods because there's some unfriendly creatures still in, in the woods. So I, I just kind of go there when it's fall and, uh, and I can see my way through. But that's the, uh, that's the red brick. That's the red brick, uh, let's see. And here is a picture of, uh, of the folks drawing from a well. Now that picture is also 
a picture that's also in the Smiths, I mean, the, uh, the Museum of Natural, of uh, African American History. It's on the wall. That's a, they're drawing from a well. And uh, some of the uh, uh, Mrs. LeMasters and Miss Johnson say that they, they, they can identify some of those children in that picture right there. But uh, again, the museum was drawing a lot of the information from Montgomery County and from Sugar Land in particular. They're very interested. And I went by and took a picture of what that well looks like today. So uh, that it's covered, it's locked. But that was the well that's uh, in the picture downtown. So here's a little tiny church, a little tiny church built in 1893. And it has had very few Sunday services for months, years, years. Hardly any Sunday services now. And now that it's a museum, it's almost it's impossible to have a Sunday service. But it has been the location of some very interesting occurrences. Whoa. In 1967, it was the site of the first interracial marriage in the state of Maryland in over 300 years. It was against the law. This is from the old Washington Star newspaper of which I have a copy. And, and why did they decide to uh, come all the way out here in Poolsville or Sugar Land to be married? It's because Mr. Tillman Lee, who was in the military at the time, uh, is from Poolsville. So the ban was lifted. And this is as late as 1967, but I'm sure <laughs> a lot went on before the 1967. But this is the legal, this is the legal. They had a legal marriage. Okay, moving up. Maryland State Senate, the Maryland State Senate issues us a resolution. I say us, the Sugar Land History, uh, the History Project, they received a, a, a resolution from the Maryland Senate in 1996, right on the heels of it becoming a National Historical Site. So when you breeze by and you go up Sugar Land Road, you'll see the sign. You'll see the big plaque right there. And of course, I was invited. That's me with hair. And I was invited because my uh, great, great grandfather was William Taylor one of the three founding slaves that, uh, that were granted, that were given the land or sold the land for 25 bucks back in 1871. Hebron, Diggs, and Taylor. And at one time, the, uh, the church was called Taylor Chapel. So yeah, it's uh, deep embedded in uh, my uh, DNA. This is the program. This is the front of the program that uh, was issued or given out that day uh, uh, with the names of the descendants and it gives right uh, the information on, that's on the plaque uh, that uh, I believe there was two or three different news stations. Howard University, a lot of people came out. It was a rainy day, it was a chilly day, but it was very, very nice and very, very apropos. Okay, what is this? <laughs> what is this you say? Okay, this is, uh, we're moving up to 2012. Look at our tiny church. What, what, what does it mean here? What, what's going on? I'll tell you what's happening here is that uh, somehow uh, the stars from a British movie making company decided, hey, let's go to Sugar Land and use that church in our film. So the next time you use, you're using Redbox, or you go to Redbox, look up the movie uh, Philomena, starring Judy Dench and uh, Steve Coogan, or Coogan, yes. They were the stars of that movie. And the church in the movie is uh, supposed to be a Catholic church, a Roman Catholic church in Europe. And so they decided to leave Europe and come down here to Sugar Land. So I don't know why. 
I wish I knew the answer, but I, I really don't know. But at any rate, it was a fun time. And there's some of the uh, actors and uh, there's Gwen, uh, Caroline Taylor's on, on that and uh, Judy Dench is right in the movie, right in the middle there. And if those people who really, really like movies and things like that, she was always in, uh, Judy Dench was always in the 007 movies. So anyway, she came to, she came to Poolsville and she came to Sugar Land. And uh, in 1912, they decided to use the Poolsville St. Paul's Church. Okay, Randy Davis, his monocle. He has put out so many articles. I am so, you know, uh, thankful that he has tried his best to, uh, to impart information. Uh, he's also a personal friend, so I guess that, that, that helps. But he uh, has written so many different articles about Sugarland in particular, about the African Americans communities in general, but uh, Sugarland has always taken the lead because of my attachment. Both my grandmother and grandfather are, were from Sugarland. And here's a picture, here's a story right here that he had, uh, and uh, the next one, and uh, did we miss it? Okay. All right, and there's another story. And as you can see, uh, in this particular story, there's me and Zach in miniature. Uh, and, uh, and above uh, uh, the uh, picture with the, the family, the beautiful family right there, is my grandmother and her siblings and her mother. The red brick chimney that you saw was the matriarch in the middle, city, sitting in the middle. That was Letha. Paul Mason. Now that she's sitting in the middle and those are her children. So I guess you can see in those days, uh, you had a bunch of children. But at any rate, this is one of the articles that, uh, that Randy uh, Davis had. And there's another article. He says, Sugarland Forest, where the women are sweet as sugar, you know. But anyway, he, did, he always does a nice job and I appreciate it. And if he's zooming in tonight, thanks Randy, again. Here was a Washington Post article uh, that was, you know, as recently as 2010. Uh, they had they had uh, a series of articles on the Civil War, uh, and I think it was the, uh, the anniversary of the Civil War, maybe. 150 years ago, I'm not sure, but I think that's probably right. But anyway, uh, in, in, within the article is another another article on the Sugarland Ethno uh, Ethno History Project and the work of Gwen Reese. You can see her down there in the middle. She speaks about the churches, the faithful members that serve, and she also talked about <laughs> this dude. Okay. He uh, served in the Confederate Army, okay? And we had two church members, Basil Dorsey and Luke Heber. They both served in the Confederate, on the Confederate side. And uh, if you, you know, are very, very interested in that, to find out exactly why and for what, what reason, what I've learned and what I've heard was at the pay. The Confederates, of the rebels <laughs> paid them more. So I just happen to know that um, uh, Union soldiers only got paid $9, you know, so I don't know what they paid, 11? <laughs> so at any rate, uh, this book, My Confederate Cousin by Robert Broom Jr., I have a copy, I was given a copy of that book, it's interesting. Uh, Basil Dorsey and Luke Hebron, needless to say, they were not welcome back to the community, I don't know where they went. But uh, they served. They served in the Civil War. Uh, they were Americans, and I guess they were a little mercenaries, but whatever. But anyway, uh, that was then. What's interesting, it's interesting to note, as, I, as I've stated earlier, is that uh, although the community has its own churches and schools, 
Uh, every community had its church. Uh, these schools only educated the students up to eighth grade, up to eighth grade. Most went on to work on the farms and fields and at the quarry. As a matter of fact, that's, that, that was the place to be. At the turn of the century, a colored secondary school was opened in Montgomery County, in Rockville. And the students, if they could find the transportation, were welcome to come there. It went all the way up to 12th grade. It was called Abraham Lincoln Colored High School. And the county, Montgomery County, did not provide, provide transportation for the colored children. So the hundreds of children that could not get in to uh, get into Rockville to go to school were left uneducated beyond eighth grade. But it was not until 1956, as you know, many of you know, 1956, that these children were, were allowed to attend a high school in their own community, not until 1956. And that's a shame, but hey, Puzo High School, uh, uh, they weren't as welcoming as, <laughs> as they could have been. But again, that was 1956. This man here, snappy dresser, nice hat, always sharp. His name is William Taylor, William F. Taylor. No, they did not have cameras back in 1871 when William F. Taylor, uh, the ex-slave, found at Sugar Land. But this is his grandson, William F. Taylor II. And William F. Taylor II was my grandfather, who I lived with, and who was the first person to teach me how to throw a baseball. This was around 1922, which would have made him 22, because he was born in 1900. You do the math. Okay, and this is William Taylor. This is my grandfather uh, in, uh, uh, around 1968. And that was, that's just a guess. Very proud man. He uh, uh, lived majority of his life in Washington, D.C. He's retired from the Postal Service. But uh, he never let any, anything, any obstacles stand in his way. And his wife, Genevieve, I don't have her picture here, but her family was in the article uh, in, uh, in one, one of Randy's papers. But I, you know, I, how am I doing on time? I'm good? Okay. So yeah, uh, that's, that's my story. And the only epilogue I can say is this. Try your best. Even if the museum is not open, if it's not open, drive up Hughes Road to Sugar Land Road, drive past the cemetery, drive past St. Paul's Church, take a picture, go down Jerusalem Road to the, <laughs> to the dump, and think about the kids that were housed there to get educated in that place. And the man who forked over the money, the man who decided that this is what he wanted to do, even though these schools turned out to be cold and damp and his heart and his pocket were in the right place. And his mind was in the right place because I tell you what, you're gonna be a slave forever without education, without an education. And he knew it, Mr. Robin uh, Rosenwald, he, he knew it. So. Uh, turn it back to Melissa. Uh, I don't know whether I talk too much. Or talk. No, Skip, that yeah. was, um, so if people want to uh, come in with questions, um, Skip, that was amazing. I feel like we could have gone for a couple hours hearing oh. more about you. Um, I have to tell you right off, I'm going to be calling you because I think we need to take a little tour down to St. Paul's. We can arrange it in small groups. Where is my skip? I need skip in the middle here. There we go. There we go. Um, you know, if you can get an in with us to take small groups on a tour, 
Um, even if we do social distancing mm -hmm. with masks, only have a couple people come in at a time, I would love to set that up. And I think that we would have a group mm -hmm. very interested in doing that. So certainly doable. Certainly. I definitely will um, be in touch and then we will definitely put it out on our website. Um, let's see, somebody's asking, is there historical cem cemetery tour that we can social distance when we uh, out there? There is a cemetery. Oh yeah, there, there's a cemetery. There's a cemetery in Jerusalem and there's a cem cemetery in Sugar Land. Right. Uh, they, they still hold burials. We, they have a burial, I think they may have had a burial out there as recently as this year. They still uh, uh, do bury folks out there. I think there's enough room. I hope there's enough room because that's where I want to be buried. <laughs> so we could, we could when we tour um, the inside of the church, we could also see the cemetery there. Absolutely. You could walk absolutely. us through. Absolutely. I know some of the graves uh, uh, are written by hand. Uh, some of the uh, markers are, are really crude. Uh, but some of the headstones are really good. So you can see, you know, you can see uh, that uh, some of the descendants did the best they could to put head markers. And uh, Mr. Lyles, unique, uh, I mean, Finian Lyles' husband, uh, he is the caretaker of that cemetery and it looks nice all the time. And they live right down on Sugarland Road, but they do a wonderful job. Okay, another question is, um, does Mr. Taylor that that bought that property is he any relation to the Taylor School on White Ground Road? Uh, Edward Taylor, I, he's Boyd's. Edward U. Taylor, I have not reached or researched that. I don't okay. know. I, I don't know. Uh, uh, I, I don't think so. I think that uh, that my grandfather's brothers and sisters that they all started to go towards. Uh, Georgetown, Georgetown. That's where the migration of African Americans who left Sugar Land and uh, vicinity, they migrated in Georgetown, expensive Georgetown. <laughs> now it's expensive now, but when they went there, uh, it, it wasn't so expensive. And maybe a few in Germantown, but I just think that they are only related just by name. By name, okay. I, because I, I know a lot of the relatives, my, my grandfather's relatives. Um, another question. There was an article by Tanisha Coates about attending a service at St. Paul's and he mentions the schoolhouse there. Is the schoolhouse gone now? Uh, did he say Sugarland? Um, I, it doesn't say in the question. It just says at St. Paul's, so I don't know. Uh, he's too young to, <laughs> the, uh, there was a, uh, uh, a uh, charity hall there for a number of years, which every single solitary community had what they call a charity hall. That, and I didn't talk about that, but in Martinsburg and in Big Woods, if you had a church, you had a charity hall. And the charity hall was nothing more than a place to, you know, to eat and celebrate and drink because you couldn't drink and celebrate in the church. It was right. called a charity hall. And it, always it, was, it was in reference to Sugar Land. I'm seeing another response from the same person. Yeah, uh, no, no, there was no school. Uh, it, it's as far back as 50 years. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of people thank you for sharing. Um, the personal history really adds a touch uh, <laughs> to hear your background and all of that. Um, so I'm getting a lot of thank yous on the chat. Everybody's very appreciative. Um, there's some people that are asking um, to, they'd like to learn more about the stories of the railroad, the Underground Railroad. So I don't know if you are the person, but I know you can put me in connection with that person if you are not the one. So um, definitely like a lot of interest. Um, well, they, wanna, they wanna go search for that, uh, that cave. In, in the fall and winter, in the fall and winter. I have a neighbor who uh, did some research and she seems to think that she knows where it is. Really? Yes. Okay. You know, okay. I'm not, I'm not uh, you know, 
excited about trying to find it as long as it, as, as long as it's uh, winter. I might be inclined to find it. To find but, it, yes. that would be fun. Um, yeah. Somebody mentioned that there was that Guy Jewel uh, wrote um, prepared a lot of history on small African American schools in Montgomery County. They want to know if you've been able to see that book. It's been out of print. No, I have not. Yeah. Okay. So I sorry. remember the name, but I have not seen this book. Okay. There is a book coming out. Uh, G. Uh, he, he did some research, he contacted me, uh, and he is, uh, oh my goodness, he is uh, contacted Gwen, and he's writing a book on the history of Sugar, of all places, on the history of Sugarland. And oh. he, I think it's uh, Jeff Sapek. Jeff Sapek. And he, his, his, uh, his uh, girlfriend is a teacher at uh, Hussle High School. And we have collaborated, and uh, Jeff is just a great guy, uh, absolute gem of a guy. And I don't know when he's going to complete this his study and his book, but uh, yes, that's his that's his name, Jeff Sapek. Sapek, yeah. Okay, we'll skip with if everybody would unmute themselves. Skip, thank you so much. It's a wonderful way to spend the evening. It was wonderful. Everybody Thank can you. yell and clap. Thank you. Your appreciation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Skip, that really appreciate it, Skip. Hey, I, I have my, Thank you. I have my team right here. Faith and Zach. Right. Now we're, we're going to be seeing him on. There's Chuck. Hey. Hey, that's my boss. Class. I'm proud of him. Yeah, there you go. I learned a lot tonight. Good. Well, I have to mention, since he's on here talking, Chuck <laughs> is going to be one of our speakers in November. So uh -oh. make sure that you get uh -oh. onto our website so you can see when he's coming. Yeah. So, so Mr. Etheridge, tell Zach I'm going to need him to help me, too. <laughs> you set the standard. <laughs> Didn't you buy that red note from me? <laughs> we have a lot of interesting things coming up, and if anybody has any um, suggestions or if they know of anybody that can share their mm -hmm. history, a program, you know, on a multitude of topics, we are happy to have you as part of our programming with the Senior Center. So you just find us and let us know. All right. But I want to thank everybody thank for spending their time with us, and we'll see everybody soon. Thanks for setting Thank it up, you Melissa. So Thank, Thank you, you so, much. so much. This was Bye. awesome. Great job, Thank you, Mr. E. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. E. It was wonderful. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Very good. Very good. Awesome.